these videos, we're aiming to create an online library where if you don't manage to come to Full Circle uh, or any of our events that we think are worth putting up, you can come uh, in your own time and look at this video and learn about the topic. Hello everyone, my name is Henry Clifford and I'm a senior green coffee trader here at DR Wakefield. Today we're going to talk about farm gate pricing. Sorry, my slides keep running away from me. Um, we're going to talk about what is farm gate pricing. We're going to talk about what is FOB pricing, how they differ, what are the challenges with these pricing structures. And then we're going to go to outcomes desired by the coffee community and methods to achieve said outcomes. My slides are not running at all. There we go. So what is farm gate pricing? Well, farm gate pricing defined by the OECD is the price of the product available at the farm, excluding any separately billed transport or delivery charge. The FAO defines it quite similar, um, but they put more emphasis on the fact that it excludes transport. And so I think for me, the, the key things here that we need to look at are product and location. So we know that there is a, a product at the farm. That's all we know at the moment. And as you can see here, I've got a picture of parchment at the farm. I've also got a picture of parchment in a warehouse. And as we'll see later on, some people refer to farm gate pricing differently. So for example, if you're in the picture on the left and someone is buying your coffee, that would be in sort of strict definition, more of a farm gate price. Whereas if you're a producer and you're, you've moved your parchment to a warehouse, um, whether it be at the cooperative or um, some middleman, that would, a lot of people refer to that as farm gate pricing, but there is an element of transport. So actually we're not really comparing the same thing. So I just wanted to make you guys aware um, that we're talking about products and location here. So let's first talk about the product. We know that the farmer has a product and we know we're talking about coffee. So we could therefore conclude that we're talking about one thing when actually the reality is quite different. So as a farmer, you could sell the product as cherry, you could sell the product as parchment. And in reality, the price that you get for both things are very different because in order to get from cherry to parchment, there's quite a lot of processing involved and with the processing involves costs. So even when we're talking about the farm gate price, unless we specify what the product is, um, it's, it can be quite a confusing piece of information. And even when we've got the product, how are we going to be measuring this product? Are we measuring it in kilos? Are we measuring it in, in Dallas? Are we measuring it in Cargas, in Colombia? These are all things that are very relevant um, and they need to be outlined because if you're trying to understand a farm gate price, if you're trying to compare it, and if you're trying to work out is it fair, then you need to understand the unit of measurement that's being quoted. Um, you know, Ethiopian burrs per kilo uh, and Guatemalan quetzals per quintal are obviously very different. So we need to be able to contextualize what we're talking about here. If we assume that we, we know what we're talking about in terms of the, the unit of measure and the product, there's also the currencies taken into account. So typically, uh, well, not typically, always a farm gate price, because it's at the farm gate level, will be paid in local currency. So if you're seeing a farm gate price in dollars, then it's likely that whoever has given you that piece of information has had to make some assumptions to get from the local currency price to the dollar price. So these are all things to be aware of because really, if we're reporting on information, we need to be able to understand that information. Um, recently, I read a very interesting article by um, someone that wrote an article for something in the, in the Harvard um, Press. I think it was the ex-CEO of Timberland. He, he talked about sustainability and reporting. And it's obviously it's very good to report, but you need to make sure that what you're reporting is clear so that people can actually understand that information and make sure that it's worthwhile information to have. So in this farm gate price, we've got the product, we have the unit of measure, we have the currency. So that, that should be everything that we need to take into account regarding farm gate pricing. What about FOB pricing? Because everyone talks about FOB pricing in the coffee industry. Why do they do that? Well, FOB means free on board. It's an inco term. 
And generally speaking, if you're a roaster or an importer buying coffee from origin, it's likely that you're going to be buying off an FOB contract. And FOB contracts are, are useful, they're, they're very clear. Um, and I'm just going to take a, an extract from Shippo here. Under FOB shipping terms, the seller is responsible for all costs involved in the process up until the goods are on the vessel at the designated port. So whereas for a farm gate price, you could have a farm gate price in Southern Colombia, in Calcutta. You could have a farm gate price uh, in Northern Colombia, in, in Santa Marta. Um, you, you, the, obviously, it's, it's at the farms. This could be in various different ports, uh, locations in the country. When we're talking about FOB pricing, generally speaking, in origin, there are a number of ports um, per country. Sometimes one can, can go up to two or three. But if you've got an FOB price, it's a bit clearer in terms of what the price involves and what you're getting for that price. Because you know that that price is the price of, of the coffee when it's on the ship ready to leave origin. And we talked earlier about a few, not challenges, but interesting bits that you need to understand about the, the farm gate price. Um, that can be challenging if you don't understand the terminology used. But the great thing about FOB is that it's a little bit clearer. So earlier we talked about the challenges regarding products. Are we talking about parchment? Are we talking about natural coffee? Are we talking about anything in between? With FOB pricing, although I can be buying um, honey processed coffee or natural processed coffee or wash processed coffee, and these indeed are different products, I would argue that because they are all export ready, green coffee, um, they are the same product. So if I'm buying FOB, I'm buying a product which is ready for export and is ready to be roasted at said destination. So in that sense, the FOB price is a bit clearer. What about the units that you measured? Well, if we're talking FOB pricing, the vast majority of contracts will be in US cents a pound. Sometimes it can be in dollars a kilo, dollars per 50, but the vast majority is US cents a pound. So again, in this instance, it's easier to comprehend that information. And probably guessed it, I've already mentioned it. Um, coffee is a US dollar denominated commodity. Therefore, all FOB contracts will be in US dollars. So a lot of the challenges or on issues that are potentially unclear in farm gate pricing, uh, in FOB pricing, they are very clear. So I just wanted to sort of mention that because I think as an industry, because we're, we're much more comfortable with FOB pricing because we use it all the time, there's, there's a lot less uncertainty when people are talking about those terms. And you could argue, well, if you've got an FOB price, how, how do you know how much percent goes back to the farmer? And that is, that's valid. Um, I'm just trying to say that I think when people talk about FOB pricing, because you have that certainty of product, units, and currency, we're talking, when we're talking, when we're having that conversation, we're talking apples and apples, not apples and pears. So and if, you, if you look at this picture here, um, this is the same warehouse in Calca in Southern Colombia. Um, I'll just put a little map here. If, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's, if we're buying from that warehouse on a farm gate level, which is the, the smaller circle in that picture, and um, we're shipping out of Cartagena port in the north, obviously the transport costs from um, Calca to Cartagena are going to be a lot more than, say, for example, if we bought the coffee in Bucamaranga, which is a bit further north uh, in the larger circle. There's obviously milling and finance and all the different costs which are from farm to FOB. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you have an FOB price and you have two farmers, one in Bukamaranga and one in Kauka, because there's less transport, it's probably more likely that the farm gate price in Bukamaranga will have a represent a greater percentage of the FOB price. But this doesn't necessarily mean that he's that it's a more sustainable price than the price that's in Southern Colombia. Um, 
it just it, that's just representing the lower transport cost. So I, I mentioned that because with all these things, you know, it's good to have information, but equally with this information comes quite a few caveats and you really need to dive into the details to really fully understand what's going on. Um, you know, personally, if someone said to me, that's, that coffee's worth 20 Ethiopian birth per kilo, or that coffee's worth um, 100, 140 um, or 40, 1400 Colombian pesos per cargo, wouldn't necessarily mean too much to me. So I think there's you've got to be a way of contextualizing these prices, and we will come up with that later on. So what are the challenges with these pricing structures? Um, I've bolded out some of the key themes that I'd like to pick up on. I mentioned the first point now, and to be honest, the first point is why we're all having this conversation is because we want to, we want fair pricing. We want to ensure that the farmers are getting a fair price. Um, now, I mentioned, you know, I put here, does, does the farmer get 60%? Do they get 80%? Um, is the price they're getting sustainable? How do we know these things? And, um, you know, if you were just to use that percentage, it, it's, a, it's a nice indicator, but I think you need more details to really understand what's going on there. Um, so that's, that's interesting. I think you know, fair pricing is the, the key here. But even if you do get a farm gate price, and let's assume that you do understand it, can you compare it to other farm gate prices? You know, if you're trying to, you're talking about price discovery and you're trying to find a fair price for the, for the supplier and for the customer, um, you know, do, do you have the knowledge to understand that price? And is the methodology um, that you're using in terms of the product, the currency, the assumptions you're making, are they correct? And can you compare that price? These, these are all quite critical things that you've got to bear in mind. And even if you do have a farm gate price, um, how do you know that it is fair? Can you contextualize it? Can you benchmark it? Um, can you do this across various different countries? You know, if you're sourcing from 25 different countries, um, are you familiar with all the local currencies and com um, com com complications and details in each origin? And if you are accessing information to benchmark, should we know every detail about a farmer's life? Um, there's also privacy concerns. And if you can get all these bits of information, can you verify it? Um, so really, I, I've, I've put at the bottom here that we've got the two key aspects for me here are, one is methodology. So are we singing from the same hymn sheet? Um, and if you know you are singing from the same hymn sheet, what does it actually mean? Can you, can you contextualize it? The second point is data. So should we have everything that we are gathering? Can we store it cor correctly? And also, can we verify and trust that information? And it's, why is this important? Well, this is more important for farm gate pricing because for FOB pricing, that's just the price to the exporter. Whereas for farm gate pricing, you're at someone's farm um, and therefore the information is a lot uh, more sensitive, I, I would argue. So th these, are the, these are not, these are not um, barriers to entry. Uh, for farm gate pricing, but these are just things to bear in mind. Um, we we want to make sure that we've got good information. We need to make sure that we've got information that we can understand and we can compare. So that takes me to desired outcomes by the coffee community. Why I put this here now? Well, as I said earlier, the the reason that we're talking about farm gate pricing is because we want to ensure that farmers get fair pricing. Um, that's that's why we're here, that's why we're talking. But people often forget about pickers. You know, for, for, for large farms, um, often they're, they're, there is a whole number of pickers who are on that farm. And we need to make sure that they're getting looked after as well. And there's been a bit of a movement recently, especially with fair trade, looking into for the larger farms, um, how they treat their workers. And, and also, you know, for if, if you are a small holder and you've only got, say, 0 0.5, 2 hectares, are you going to be picking the coffee 
or will it be to some members of your family? Um, and if that's the case, then you need to sort of record that as well as a, as a cost, because that is a cost, because if you weren't doing it, you, you would be outsourcing it um, to a picker. So I just wanted to mention pickers because I, I feel like they don't get enough airtime. Um, we've all talked about the farmer, but actually, um, unless we're talking about cooperative coffee and smallholder farmers, if we're talking about larger estates, then the, the pickers are really, they're the, they're the more vulnerable party in the supply chain. But we also want fair pricing for millers, for exporters, for importers, for roasters, for the cafes, and, and also for the consumer. They should pay a fair price, but they should receive one as well. And the most important thing for me is we want coffee to be sustainable, economically, socially, environmentally. In order for this business to thrive and keep going forward, everyone needs to make money. So I just wanted to put those outcomes um, that we desire here, because the ones that stick out really for me are, as you can see, the farmers and the pickers. Um, you know, people have talked about how we're in a persistently low price climate and how that has perpetuated poverty across certain coffee growing communities. So these are the ones that we really, you know, the farmers and the pickers are the areas that we need to concentrate our time. And I wanted to quickly talk about the global coffee industry because talking about vulnerable parties in the supply chain and power, I think everyone's probably uh, familiar with a monopoly where one supplier dictates the market. And people are probably familiar with an oligopoly where a few suppliers dominate a market. And do, do we have that in coffee? I think we do because we have many, many suppliers um, in coffee and many people trying to sell. So I think the sellers outnumber the buyers. So no, I don't think we have that. I read a very interesting article last year about this term. I, I'd never come across it. It's called oligopsony. Investopedia describes it as a market for a product or service, which is dominated by a few large buyers. The concentration of demand in just a few parties gives each substantial power over the sellers and it can effectively keep prices down. Is this what's happening? Well, to a degree, a little bit, yes, because actually, if you look at the concentration in percentage terms of global coffee production, in, of where it's going, actually, it, it is dominated by a few large um, corporations. So I think in order for us to garner better prices, then it, it needs to be buyer-led. We need to ensure that producers are not just price takers, and that in, there's some kind of collaboration that can be sought. I don't think there'll ever be price setters, um, but there's got to be a bit of a change up in the dynamic of power there um, to try and get them at a price. Um, I just wanted to say that because I think it's important that we recognize that there's got to be a buyer-led solution here. Um, and, and that's why we're here today. So let's go to the next slide. Well, yeah, power. So we need to think about how to change that dynamic of power in our industry. So how do we do that? How do we achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve? Well, one, one potential way is, is through farm gain and FOB pricing analyses. Um, we talked about that today. I think that we're still quite early on in our journey regarding farm gate pricing. Um, in researching this talk, I, I learned a whole load about um, farm gate and, and FOB pricing. Um, I've still got loads to learn, but I think uh, it's interesting. And I think you know that, uh, there's been a lot of work done uh, by various different parties, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, there's also the role of certifications. So traditional certifications like fair trade, rainforest, um, they've done a lot. There's also B Corp, which we'll come on to. And there's also the power of relationships. Um, and these, you know, one, two, and three, they're not, they're not mutually exclusive. They can be used uh, in, harmony, in harmony with each other. Um, but I just want to do, for me, the, these are the sort of three methods that stick out in terms of how do we get to where we want to be? How do we get to a situation where farmers are getting fairer pricing? I just want to caveat that. When I say fairer pricing, 
we want to be paying prices that ensure people can thrive, not just survive. So we need to be going, we need to take the, the narrative and the dialogue beyond the cost of production and actually talk about living income. And we'll go to that in a minute. So we talked about farm, farm gate pricing. Let's, um, if we, let's make some assumptions and we should be comfortable with making assumptions because what I've, what I've learned certainly is when we talk about farm gate pricing is that lots of assumptions are made. Um, so we assume here that we understand farm gate pricing and that we're able to get it. Um, then we need to talk about benchmarking. So if we do have a farm gate price in, I'll go back to my earlier example, Kalka, Southern Colombia, and uh, Bukamaranga in sort of central North Colombia. In order to get that farm gate price, are the farmers using the same methodology? You know, are we comparing the same farm gate price? Um, because actually, if they, if, they, if they themselves have made different assumptions, like for example, earlier I talked about how you know, it's important that they do record the amount of time they pick if they're picking it themselves, because this would be costed in by um, a farmer who's using third party labor. So that they need to make sure that they are comparing um, the same thing, they're using the same format. But if they do um, use the same methodology, and the data is reliable. Um, then we, we start looking at what, what, what costs of production are they recording? What are their living costs? What are their yields? What are their profitability? And, and what's the living income of the area? Uh, because the more I read about living income, the more um, I, I was quite surprised by how it can differ so much between areas. And actually I thought about it and it's not that surprising really if you think just take the UK as an example, we've got a minimum wage, we've got a living income wage, we've also got a London living income. And the reason that there's a London living income is because uh, living costs are much higher in London. So why would this be different anywhere else? Um, it's not. And I think that's quite interesting to talk about the difference between regions in a country, countries and um, the globe. You know, we talk, I think one of the great things about fair trade there's always been the minimum, there is a minimum price. Um, there are many pros and cons of fair trade, but I think the fact that there is a minimum price has, has been fantastic, but it's a global minimum price. So I think the question that I have to ask myself is, well, maybe we should have a country minimum price. And even in a country, should there be um, different minimum prices as, as across various coffee producing reasons? It's just something I thought I'd mention. But if we, look at living income. Um, the way that most people record living income is using the anchor methodology. So I think this is good. I, from the research I've done, it seems to be the case that most people um, use the anchor methodology when trying to establish a living income benchmark. Um, one of the most famous um, living, living income benchmarks was set up by the founding members of the Global Living Wage Coalition, which was Fair Trade International, Good Weave International, Rainforest Alliance, Social Accountability International, and Books. And the goal was to produce a methodology to promote living income that enables us to contextualize pricing and therefore reach fair pricing. So the interesting thing here is the fact that you know, we're trying, again, we're trying to contextualize information. We're trying to collect information in the same way. And then we're trying to see, place that information and understand it because the goal is to determine a green coffee price that meets farmers' um, livelihood needs, not just cost of production. And I've just put here a, I've actually lifted it, and I think I have that reference, yeah, from Fair Trade Living Income Reference Price Model. And it dives in a little bit about how they've reached a living income benchmark. And if you haven't read it yet, it's very interesting. I encourage you to go and, go and read it on the, on the Fair Trade website. Um, they've done a lot of work there, and what I've learned as well is a lot of a lot of the work is quite it's quite bitty and it requires a lot of resource. And um, yeah, I think Fair Trade done a great job in, in trying to unpack some of that. Um, I put here living income varies region to region. Um, I've covered that already. I wanted to mention a um, verified living income white paper by Bellworth Coffee, Asso Pep. Sable Harvest, Hyper International, and CLAC. That was produced recently, and 
I read, I read that as soon as it was produced, I think it was a few weeks ago. And that really is, it's a great paper and it, and it sort of unpacks a lot of the key themes, which I think we should all probably know about now, especially if we're talking about farm gate pricing. And that was a sort of global collaboration between all those stakeholders just mentioned. And they wanted to assess whether the coffee that was being paid to the farmer um, reflected the living income of the, air, of the area, basically. And so what they did was they got a, they, they managed to find, I think it was not that many producers, to be fair, and they did mention that, you know, in terms of the data sets, quite small. I think it was 38 from memory. Um, but they, they, got, they got the data, they worked out the cost of production, the verified living income farm gate price, and then the verified living effort, the verified living income FOB price. And then they looked at that and, and, and sort of compared the FOB price that they'd been paying that year. And what they concluded was actually they weren't paying enough. So um, in December 2020, after the study, they revised their pricing upwards um, to reflect that. And here we have the information. And if you look at that, what I really liked about that study was the information was so clear. And, um, you know, I think that it, it just showed that with good information, with, with rigorous data collection, you, you can actually um, achieve great outcomes using these analyses, but they are, um, there's, it, it's still a lot of work needs to be done. And, and I think one of the key things of that study was saying that you need stakeholder buy-in across the whole chain um and in, you know in, in order to do this it's obviously not without its own cost you know to, to 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 get all this data um from every bit of the supply chain to verify it to to ensure that everything's handled correctly it does cost money as well so um i, I guess moving forward one of the things we if we want to, to do these kind of things um we would need to sort of chat to everyone in the supply chain, see if, see if it can, see if it makes sense to be done. Because I'm sure, just like anything, that you know, a different solution is required for a, a different challenge. So in this case, it worked very well. Not to, you know, we'll, we'll go on to some of the um, challenges in, in a bit. But um, we've looked at farm gain and FAB price analyses. Uh, I think you know, we've concluded that it's quite early days. But a lot of work has been done and a lot of good work is, is, is currently being carried out. So then we talk about certifications. So I think actually this slide is not to be here. Uh, it's not. I'm just going to talk about certifications then. So recently DL84 became B Corp certified. B Corp, B Corp certification is quite interesting because if you look at some of the traditional um, certifications that people in the coffee industry have had, like Rainforest and Boots and Fair Trade, often the analysis is done mainly on the producing side. And if you are on the buying side and you're a roaster or you're a importer, it's usually um, it, the, the certification at that level is just verifying that you are doing all of the things which the certification says you should do regarding the suppliers. But actually, um, B Corp doesn't just go on how you source, it also goes on how you treat the next person in the supply chain, how you treat your staff. And it's quite an interesting certification that provides a different approach to um, doing business in general. So it will look at your environmental credentials, it will look at your social credentials, um, it's, it's an interesting certification and it you know, even, even to be B Corp, you, you need to actually show uh, examples of, of how you negotiate when, when you buy, when you purchase to show that it is more of a collaboration. It's not just um, going back to what we talked about earlier with, with power dynamics and how sometimes um, in certain industries, the producers are just price takers. You need to show there's some kind of um, give and take there. But that, obviously, if, if you're buying from B Corp com company, then you know that, that, that there is that certain minimum standard of uh, an approach to business. And equally, if you're buying fair trade coffee, for example, you know that there is a minimum price for fair trade. Um, everyone has to jump through certain hoops. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that when, I looked early, when we looked earlier at the global living wage, that the founding members who set up that living income benchmark 
I don't think there were five of them, and three of them were names that we know very well, Rainforest, uh, Fairtrade, and uh, Woods. So I think definitely buying from certifications, um, you know, it, it, it's no guarantee that, that, there's a fair, that there's fair pricing involved, but it certainly makes it more likely. And relationships, whether you are visiting origin, whether you are speaking to them a lot, or you know your importer is, these, um, this is a massive thing, which is, again, probably not talked about enough. Um, but you know, DOA was formed in 1970, and some of the people that we work with, we've been working with for, like, yeah, probably older than I am, to be honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's important when we talk about how do we achieve fair pricing for farmers, to not fixate on one approach, I think uh, we need to use everything which is in our armory. And you know, certainly, if you if you use two out of these three methods of achieving better outcomes, then I think it's you know it's a pretty solid, um, robust sourcing approach. Um, so if we look at the conclusions that um, we've drawn today, I think yeah, reporting on farm gate pricing can certainly be a useful way of verifying if farmers are getting fair prices, but it's not the only way. And we need to ensure that we, we, we understand, A, what that, farm, that farm gate pricing refers to, and B, if we've got that pricing, can we contextualize it and understand if it's fair? We've also looked at the role of certifications, although not perfect, they do increase the likelihood um, and the chance of farm getting a better price. Um, and actually, I wanted something I actually forgot to mention earlier, but we, we talked about different methods of achieving better outcomes, but also I think we probably need to discuss the product as well, because if you've got a commercial coffee or conventional coffee that is just quite cheap and potentially um, lacks traceability, then it's going to be quite difficult to get farm gate pricing. Um, so actually, you know, potentially, if you can get it rainforest certified, that, that might be the best way to achieve that outcome for that product. I think that's something which we need to recognize as well because it, it's you know the, the industry is not just micro lots and higher scoring coffees that there, there will always be a role of, of lower scoring coffees it doesn't necessarily mean we can't source in a good way but it might mean that the, the way is slightly different we've established that it's early days in the analysis of farm gate pricing um we've also established that fab pricing is clear and there will always be a role for fab pricing whether that's because um, for pre-finance reasons, whether if, you know, if you've got a contract in dollars or any of these things, um, there will always be a role for FOB pricing and, and it, it's very clear. So if we want to try and emulate that in farm gate pricing, you probably need to be consistent as an industry regarding a methodology and how to get it. Um, I've got 0.5 there, which I'm going to jump the gun. Um, different methods might be better for different coffees. This is something which we need to accept and um, work with. Um, and then number six is the role of a good supply chain and actors who want to work together and reach better outcomes. I think, um, you know, sometimes if, if you're not able to get uh, information that, that we like on certain coffees, then you need to think, well, is that coffee certified or what, what, are, what are the companies involved here? To, to, is the export a good? Is the import a good? Um, uh, you know, are, they, are they trying to ask the right questions? Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're, Asking these questions does require resource. Um, so it might not be an overnight thing, but you know, are, are people trying to move in the right direction? These are all things which are important when you're, when you're looking at your supply chain. I think to be honest, that is everything I want to discuss today. And I look forward to chatting to you more in the breakout rooms. Thank you for listening and I will speak to you soon.